Hi, I'm George Newhouse. I've got almost 30 years worth of experience working as a lawyer in Australia and in the United Kingdom. One of the more interesting areas that I've practiced in is defamation law. In this lecture pod, I'm going to explain the basics of defamation law, and I'm going to discuss how defamation law and its implementation has been changed by technology and by some landmark cases. So let's start by defining defamation. Defamation is any statement which would make a reasonable person think less of the person is the subject of that statement. Defamation law has developed to protect people from claims or statements made about them that unfairly damage their reputation. To be successful in an Australian court, a plaintiff or a complainant must prove to a judge or a jury the following things. Number one, the imputations, that is the meaning of what was said, was defamatory. Number two, that the defamation was communicated to another person or persons. And finally, that the defamatory material identifies the complainant. If an individual has been defamed, they have 12 months to commence legal proceedings from the date of first publication. Commencing court proceedings for defamation outside this time limit is restricted. Now, we have national defamation laws in Australia, so there are many federal and state jurisdictions available to commence proceedings in. But most people choose the court that's nearest to them because that is where their reputation is most likely to be harmed. Some litigants choose the federal court because this means their case will be heard by a judge only without a jury. They or their advisers must believe that their case will be enhanced without a jury trial. Now, the internet has had an impact on defamation. Once, you would have had to sue a US newspaper for defamation in the United States if that was the place of publication. Now you can sue wherever the defamatory content is available to download. Now, what makes people think less of you can and does change over time. For example, to call someone a de facto spouse or a rape victim a hundred years ago was insulting and may have been defamatory, but not now. The meaning ascribed to words and the language we use changes over time. What the court needs to do is to consider the context of the insult in determining its impact. Consider the example of Bennett and Cohen. Ian Cohen, a New South Wales Uphouse MP, called a developer a bully and a thug during a town hall meeting. Now the court found in that case that the words were defamatory in that context even though calling a person a thug at, say, a football game would probably not have been considered defamatory in that very different context. Sometimes an individual isn't even named in a story, but it's obvious that the defamation is about that person. In such a case, the plaintiff must prove that the publication actually identified them. To do this, the court applies an ordinary reasonable person test. So consider, for example, a current affair TV program runs a program on city crime and entraps and films a man picking up a wallet left on the ground. The imputation of the current affairs report is that the man is a thief. In fact, the person takes the wallet directly to a police station and reports it as lost but that isn't covered in the story. But in that case, the man is identified in the vision and would have reasonable prospects of success in a defamation case if he was clearly shown in that program, since the imputation that he's a criminal is false and clearly false. It's worth noting, if you're a media producer, that sometimes failing to directly identify someone is even more risky because it opens you up to multiple lawsuits by people who can claim that you were actually referring to them in your report and that a reasonable person might have assumed this. So it's best practice to ensure that any accusations or claims that you make are true and correct 
and that your report is accurate and fair. And in many cases, such as police reports or news reports, you should name the person in full. Media outlets even go to as far to use the middle name of people and their suburbs to ensure that they don't confuse people. For example, there are many Bill Smiths in Australia, and to avoid defaming them, it's a good idea to say, William John Smith of Zetland was charged with such and such offence today. Identification can be tricky. For example, you can't defame a class or a group. If someone says, all lawyers are thieves or rogues, there are too many people in the category of lawyers to identify a single individual. Around 5 to 15 is the limit for a defamation case involving a group. You could defame the players in an identified football team, for example, by saying the Geelong alligators are all drug addicts or the board of directors of a company are all crooks. They could be identified. There are other restrictions on plaintiffs. For example, a company can't sue unless it has less than 10 employees or is a not-for-profit a corporation. But the company may have other remedies like injurious falsehood and misleading and deceptive conduct that are available to them. And of course, you can't defame the dead as it's impossible to restore a reputation under our law if the defamed is deceased. There are many defences a plaintiff can use to argue that they had the right to defame someone. Now let's look at some of them. Firstly, truth is a complete defence to defamation. No longer do you have to prove that it was in the public interest. So you may defame someone if you are telling the truth about them, but more importantly, you need to consider how you're going to prove the truth of that statement later if it ever goes to court. Secondly, the defence of innocent dissemination may, may apply to booksellers, libraries or news agents who distribute material. The question is whether the secondary publisher could have known or ought reasonably to have known that the material was actually defamatory. Thirdly, a person may have a defence to a defamation claim where the plaintiff is unlikely to suffer any harm because the claims being made are trivial and don't put their reputation at risk. Also, if someone consented to something being said about them, if they gave you permission, they can't then complain when it's actually published. Of course, you need to be careful as a media producer that the permission is clear and is in writing. Now there is an additional defence, which is absolute and qualified privilege, which basically means that in some environments, like in parliament or court or reporting a matter to the police or a teacher, you are actually permitted to make defamatory claims, provided they're not malicious. In one controversial example, New South Wales politician Frank Arena said in New South Wales Parliament, the Premier and others had engaged in a conspiracy to cover up for pedophiles. And she was protected from potential defamation suit because she said it in Parliament where it was protected. Now, the same rule applies to statements made in, in public court hearings and tribunals, but these protections are not absolute. Consider a pretty dull court case, for example. Journalists do not report on any aspect of the case except the embarrassing evidence given by a particular person. Even though there's a privileged right to report on the case, the report must be fair and balanced. And if a jury was to find the report unfair, then the publisher may lose that defence. Also, as I mentioned earlier, defences of privilege can be defeated by malice, bad faith. To decide if there's malice, a judge will consider the facts of the case. Take the Joe Hockey defamation case, for example. In that case, the judge used text messages and emails that the editor sent to other editors about Joe Hockey and Joe Hockey's demands for an apology to, for, to find that the newspaper 
and its bill posters and its tweets were predominantly motivated by a personal animus towards Mr Hockey. Another important defence to defamation is honest opinion. Now this defence covers the expression of an opinion on matters of public interest, such as political commentary, restaurant, art and theatre reviews, literary criticism and even sport commentary. But again, the protection is not absolute. A terrible review of a play, which provides no reasons, may not hold up in court. And a review that is not expressed as opinion and is ultimately found to be untrue is also a problem. Consider the case of a reviewer, Leo Schofield, who wrote a review about a restaurant. Where, and he wrote in that review that a dish was appallingly overcooked, charred, a husk of a shell. This opinion was found to be defamatory, as the words were not expressed as an opinion, they were expressed as fact, and the newspaper could not prove that the facts which were expressed in the review were actually true. Discerning fact and opinion is difficult. Comment and facts often merge, and reviewers need to take care. To say food was overcooked is different from saying the food tasted as, as though it was overcooked. Commentators might want to take a witness and take photos of the dish to confirm what they're writing about in the future. It's also important to note that malice defeats the defence of honest opinion. So if a reviewer has had a public fallout with a theatre producer and this motivates his or her harsh, very critical review, it does not matter if others could argue that the review made fair criticisms. An offer of amends has been developed by our legislature to encourage a quick response in order to avoid litigation. A reasonable and formal offer of amends could be a defence to a defamation case. And it's also important when considering whether to settle the matter that a court cannot actually order an apology. Usually, its orders are limited to removal of an offensive article or damages. So a quick apology and a good settlement may be attractive to many whose reputations are defamed. It's usual for an apology to be published on a similar page and in a similar font and not buried away in the fine print. Often, apologies are agreed on first but note that it is not an apology to repeat the defamation by saying words like, I'm sorry I said he was a pig. When considering an award for damages, a judge will think about a rational and appropriate relationship between the harm and the damage. Now, many of you will be familiar with the 2017 Rebel Wilson case. In that case, an actor, Rebel Wilson, won the highest defamation damages ever recorded by an Australian court. In that case, the defendant, magazine publisher Bauer Media, was ordered to pay Rebel Wilson more than $4.5 million in damages for defaming her in a series of salacious stories in 2015. Now, the amount of damages was so high in Ms Wilson's case because in addition to the hurt to herself, she was able to provide evidence that the article resulted in her suffering economic loss. So in addition to the reputational damage that she suffered, she also lost a number of lucrative film roles. In their defence, Bauer Media tried to characterise its articles as true or as trivial. However, Justice Dixon strongly criticised Bauer Media for failing to investigate the claims about Wilson and for publishing them, knowing that they were false. A number of emails were included in evidence that showed that the journalist knew the claims being made were not proven. In the Rebel Wilson case, the judge observed that the information published was based on a source who required payment and also anonymity, and the evidence showed that the editor considered this source had an axe to grind. He said that the continued publication of articles was motivated by the pursuit of profit. Their conduct was orchestrated, he said, 
It was a campaign designed to cast a slur on Miss Wilson that would attract interest. Now, I hope this has provided you with some basic information about defamation that will be useful to you as a media producer. My closing advice to you is to keep in mind that it's very easy to damage the reputation of the subjects of your production, so always seek legal advice or stick to defaming the dead. <laughs>